I love that picture that that song paints of the Christ after the resurrection and he ascends to the Father. And yeah, we find that story in the Revelation where the Father has a scroll in his hand and the people are saying, who's worthy to go get that scroll and take it out of the Father's hand because it needed to be a human being to do that. It's the title deed to planet Earth. And mankind was intended to rule this earth and they gave it over to the devil through sin. And that section of scripture there is so magnificent because it talks of the Lamb of God who was slain, who is now worthy. And he's the worthy one. And he goes, and you see this, you can picture it. He goes to his father and he takes that scroll out of his hand. And then he begins to break those seals and things all starts to, stuff starts to happen. And it's still happening today. We're going to Galatians 5, starting at verse 6 today. <laughs> It says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. Now, we have been talking through this whole letter about the fact that these Ju Judaizers had come in after Paul left the Galatian area and had perverted the gospel. And how they perverted it is they were adding law to grace. They were putting grace and law together. Law had a point. Law had a purpose. God gave the law to teach his children right and wrong, to teach them his conscience, his heart. But it was never going to be the way they were going to be saved. That was going to come through a faith in a work, a finished work of Jesus Christ. That's the only way we could be saved. And as we're going to say today again, as I've already tried to say this morning, the incredible sacrifice that Christ has made not only in dying for us, but his continued sacrifice to live for us. Not to save us from sin, but now just to be our intercessor, our great high priest. That sacrifice is so amazing that we must be very, very careful. And this scriptures that I'm gonna read here today, how Christians can be unknowingly, ignorantly even be disrespectful of the sacrifice that Christ himself made. And we can't afford to be doing that, even though we're doing it ignorantly. So this circumcision versus uncircumcision, he said, none of that will get you to heaven. None of it will. He said, this is how it works. Faith working through love. The word there for working in the Greek language is the word energeo. It is literally transliterated into the English language as energy. It means energy. Uh, how many of us have been around long enough now that we might say we don't necessarily have the natural energy we had when we were a little younger? As we've said before, our little grandchildren and others, it's just crazy how much energy they've got. And as we grow older, physically speaking, there's some waning of that energy. It doesn't mean we don't have any doesn't mean we can't do anything as people that have some maturity about us. There's people in this room that have got white hair. There's people in this room that have hair. And, and I appreciate it when we have that option. But the fact is we've gone through some stuff and we need energy. But in this case, the energy we're speaking of is a power word of the New Testament Greek language, energeo. It is the power of God to make something happen. It is the engaging of the presence, power, energy of God to make something happen. And this scripture very clearly says how faith works, which this whole letter, the Galatian letter is all about faith. How faith works or is energized is through the God kind of love. It's through the agape love. That is how it is energized. We will get to why that's even an issue here in just a moment. So the power and the motivation that we need in life is to love God and people. That is what our motivation and our power is, is to love. And both faith and love are gifts from God. We've been talking a lot. Last week we talked about faith and hope and righteousness. Those are all gifts. In fact, the, the reality is you have nothing good but what it was given to you by God. Nothing good. 
It all has come from Him. He's the Father of lights that gives all things good, the Scripture says. And we're going to go to a few other places as we usually do in Scripture to kind of put together what Paul is talking about when he says faith works or is energized by love. What does he mean by this? We'll go to 1 Corinthians 12, starting at verse 31. This is the end of a section where Paul is talking about the body of Christ, and there he's talking about the church. He says, Earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. And, and that more excellent way that he's going to talk about now is love. That's the way. That's the energizing way that faith works. He said, we still have faith. He said, we still have hope. But he said, love is the one that's going to make this work. It energizes us to do it. It is the motivation. So going on there in 1 Corinthians, going to verse, chapter 13, verse 1. Paul said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, the word there, the agape word, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. What he's saying is, you're just a lot of noise. Now, in my life, I want to stop for a moment. In the church world that I've grown up in, there have been probably times where what's coming forth from people is nothing but noise. The faith and the love is not behind it. What Paul is going to say here is we can be saying the right things, the tongues of men and angels. We can be saying words that are absolutely true. But we're not doing it through the motivation of faith that's energized by love. And he said, if that's the case, it's just a lot of noise. And sometimes I think you have to agree. You, you leave sometimes a situation with people where you think, well, there was a lot of noise there. A lot of words, but just a lot of noise. Verse 2, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith. Notice that phrase, all faith. And he's not saying that this isn't true. They actually have this, apparently, has been given over to them by God. He said, though I have all of that, so that I could even remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. This is Paul putting things in, in perspective. The love of God is what determined Jesus even doing what he did. It was the motivation behind everything. And he said, I could have all this gift of prophecy, I could have knowledge, I could have faith, I could have all faith. He said, I could remove mountains, and he said, if I don't have love, it is, means I am nothing. Verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, which, by the way, is not a bad thing to do, you know, to give to the poor. And though I give my body to be burned, meaning willing to be sacrificed for whatever it is you think is important, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now here's, here's a sad reality. There are people that have given their lives through the years for things that weren't motivated by the love of God and it didn't profit them a lick. God does want us to give to the poor. He wants us to care for the people. He wants us to share our life and our faith. He wants us to do all of those things on that list that Paul said there. Those are not bad things. Those are good things. But he said it needs to be energized by the love of God or it will profit them nothing and it will profit me nothing. Going on, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Here is what the word or the work, let me say this to you. Here is what the work or the energy of faith looks like when this energy is coming from God's love. That love suffers long. Now you guys know these, ver these verses. You've read them many times before. But we're going to go through it quickly, but just individually one more time. Here is what love looks like when it's energizing the faith that God has given us. This is what it looks like. Love suffers long. It's the word for patience in the New Testament. Love is patient. Human flesh is not patient. We don't come out of the womb patient human beings. We come out of the womb selfish human beings that are very impatient. Patience is a gift from God. And this is what love looks like. It suffers long. Now, 
these things are all going to be some category of how we're to live in relating to people, how we relate to people. We're patient. We don't give up. This is what faith working through love looks like. Love is kind. Uh, we could get into a lot of definition of what that word means. It, it certainly means not to be harsh, but kind fits the circumstance. To be kind is determined by God himself, but he said that's what love looks like. When faith is working through love, it is kind. Love does not envy. It's not jealous. It's not longing for everything else, everybody else has got. You do know that in the flesh, we all are guilty of all of these kinds of things in the human flesh. But the new Christ life that we are now, this is what love looks like. It doesn't envy those people. In fact, it could go on to say we're, we're thrilled with anything good they have got going on in their life. That's what faith working through love looks like. Love does not parade itself. That means it's not going to boast and it's not going to brag. Faith working through love doesn't need to show off. Okay? Built into humanity, you'll see this in little children, the need to show off. Now we think it's cute and you probably let it go, you know, you don't, uh, they don't go to hell just because they're doing that when they come out of the womb. But the fact is, the human flesh desires to show off, to brag, to boast. There are some people, even in the Christian world that I've been around, that it seems like that they just can't hardly talk unless they're boasting in some way. Even when it comes in left-handed, it doesn't even seem like that's what they're trying to do, but it's still coming out, you know? And that's not what love looks like. It doesn't look like that. Love is not puffed up. It's not arrogant. It's not proud. Faith working through love is not arrogant. It's not full of pride. In fact, in the scripture, if you go back to, to the devil and his, his shortcoming, his failure was because of pride. That's where all sin begins, is pride. And when he infected Adam and Eve with that sin nature, he infected us with pride. When we come to Christ, all things new, God is taking that pride from us. But it's like the flesh is still hanging around wanting to have expression. This will happen until you get your new body. The potential for a Christian to sin exists. That doesn't mean you're a sinner. But it means a Christian can sin. And one of the things that God hates, in fact, possibly at the top of the list of what God hates is pride. Pride is trying to take the place of God. It's trying to acknowledge that I have something that I didn't have to be given. It's just me. You know, I, guys, I like watching sports and things like that. We'll touch on that here in a moment. I really do. But I get so sick of the arrogant pride that comes out of some of those mouths at times. Even though they have been given great giftings and sometimes they're using them. People that can sing. You know, some, some of the people that are out there, Sherry, just baffle me at the giftings like Sherry has, for instance. Yeah. It just baffles me. How can this be? The piano playing of Craig. Kelly on those bass over there thumping those notes. You guys that have giftings that are very special, but they were given to you by God. And Paul is going to say at points in his writings, I have nothing that God didn't give me. And he said, why would I boast? Except in the Lord, except in Jesus. Love does not behave rudely. Well, that depends on who you ask. But I'll tell you right now, ask the Lord. Ask him what that means. One way you could put it is it does not act inappropriately or having bad manners. Well, what does that even mean? What was the first line on that song we just played? The world is broken. Let me tell you something. I'm a little surprised these days that there's not more of a general cultural understanding of just what good behavior and good manners are. I'm surprised by that. And I'm not saying it was ever absolute in any time in history. But I tell you now that there was a time in my younger life when it seemed like there was more of a, a, a general understanding of what good manners really is to be like, what it should look like. And I don't see so much of that now. 
and to behave rudely. That's not what love looks like, and that's certainly not what faith working through love looks like. Love does not seek its own. That just means it's not selfish. Love is not provoked. Boy, I tell you, I've said this before. Of all of the things that I may have failed through the years, up near the top of the list, is getting provoked. The enemy comes to provoke us. The scripture says he is a provoker. And you know how he does it? Through people. Provoking us. And you know, the thing is, the Lord allows these things to develop us because if there was ever any human being that ever deserved responding to the provocation, it was Jesus. They were all the time provoking him, trying to get him to sin. The devil spent all of his efforts for 33 and a half years just trying to get that man to sin, to provoke him. And you know, some people are pretty good at that, you know, provoking. They learn your buttons, the buttons to push, the right things to say, the right things to do. Love isn't provoked. So there have been times in my life as a Christian that I have given over to being provoked and I've responded in a way that is not from love. Most of the time, I think I've seen it right then. I think so. I'm not sure that's always true. But I'll tell you what, that's not what love looks like, is getting provoked and responding in anger or frustration. That's not how love looks. That doesn't mean love never speaks very strongly. It doesn't mean that doesn't happen or has to correct at times. But if my spirit is getting provoked and that's what's motivating my action, that's not what love looks like. Love thinks no evil. Now that's an interesting thing because Paul would very clearly say we are supposed to recognize when evil is out there. But he's talking about your brothers and sisters here because the context that we're in starting in 1 Corinthians at least chapter 10 going through chapter 14 is all about the church and how they're to function. How we're to get along. How we're to make things work in this life. And he said you think no evil, meaning we don't start off assuming that my brother and sister has got evil afoot. That doesn't mean they might. They might have that. And we do find that we have brothers and sisters in the Lord that do fail. But we don't want to spend time thinking evil, especially if that thinking evil is to try to bring recompense to them. Our version of uh, vengeance, that kind of thing. That isn't what love looks like. Love does not re rejoice in iniquity. That means when someone else fails. Uh, you know, sometimes people that we know fail because they set themselves up to fail. They've done bad things and, and you reap what you sow. That's out of the Word of God. But I don't rejoice when my brothers and sisters fail when they sin. I don't rejoice. In fact, if anything, it cuts us because we are so connected in ways that I'm sure most of us in this room are still trying to understand how much intimately connected we really are. Paul talks about when one member suffers, we all suffer. When one member rejoices, we all rejoice. That's in chapter 12. How connected we are in the spirit. And if my brother or sister falls into sin, rather than me rejoicing, it, it hurts. It hurts. Love rejoices on the converse in the truth. That's when we rejoice. Love bears all things. That means we put up with difficult and maybe even distasteful things. Sherry was talking about some of the things you deal with as a nurse. Just special stuff, right, Sherry? Now, that's a calling where there's great good things that can happen with great fulfillment, I am sure, and then some things that are not even in that category. Right, Melinda? Well, the fact is, human beings can be very messy. Have you guys noticed this? Starting with yourself, we can be messy. And those around us can be messy. And I am one of those that just in my humanity, I don't like messes. I like things to be orderly. On this podium right here, I've got my pad in a certain center place. I've got my clock in a center place. I like things to be where I want them to be. I don't like messy. But love bears all things. It's, it's being patient. It's, it's, it's bearing with where our brothers and sisters are at, starting with ourselves. 
Love believes all things. Now, we're not talking about that they're gullible. It's that we don't lose faith about our brothers and sisters. There's times that some people we love and care about are in a mess. They're really in a mess. But my faith is that I'm praying that God will bring them from that mess. And He will reconcile them. He will deliver them. He will heal them. Love also hopes all things. Going along with believing all things. Love endures all things. That's just the perseverance, the patience. Some have said, I've heard it said, I'm, got, I'm finished with that person. Well, I don't ever have the right to say that. That's not my call. I can't ever talk like that. Now, God can say it if He chooses to do so. But that's not ever my call. Love endures all things. And then He says it this way, Love never fails. Isn't that something? Maybe, maybe three of the most powerful words in the whole Bible. Love there being the agape love is God's love. God's love never fails. That's what faith working through love looks like. Then if you go down to chapter, of chapter 13, verse 13, Paul says, now abide. That means it's, it's alive today. Faith, hope, and love. These three. But he said the greatest of these is love. Faith and hope are primarily functional for us in the now, pressing toward the future. But love is forever. Love is who God is. God is love. And God is working in my life because He's given me the gift of His love. Now we're going to jump down in chapter Galatians chapter 5 to verses 13 through 15. We'll come back and get those other verses next week. Galatians 5, 13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. That's the freedom. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. A, a powerful statement that Paul is making that he was seeing happen in his day. I see it happen in our day. People are called to liberty in Christ, and they use that as an opportunity to go after and fulfill the lusts of their own flesh. He said, But through love... Serve one another. Just another way of saying that that's how faith works. How it's energized is through love. Through love, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if we stop and think about that for just a second. Even though at times I can offend myself and recognize oftentimes my own shortcomings, we certainly care about ourselves, And at the Christ-like side of this, we're supposed to. But he said, you need to love your brother and sister just like yourself. He said, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. And guys and girls, if you haven't seen this in the church, you haven't been looking. And I don't mean that all the church is guilty of this. But in the church, you will find these problems. And that's who Paul is writing to, is the church in Corinth. And what I have seen growing up in my life, having the privilege of growing up in the church all of my life, various arenas and segments of the church, but I have been there all my life. And I have seen people, again, not all Christians do this, of course, but I've seen those that name the name of Christ that they bite and devour one another. What do you mean by that? Well, there was a phrase uh, uh, when I was a kid, I don't know if they still use it, that people would go to church and then they would go home and have the pastor for dinner. And what they meant by that is they're going home and biting and devour with these kind of words, the failings of that pastor or someone at the church. That's what they tend to do. I want to tell you, honestly, I was in a setting in my, one of my family settings where they did this a lot. I'm not talking about my mom and dad, now I'm talking about uh, some of my relatives. That they, they were seemed like it, it, they couldn't hardly talk about another person except to talk negatively about them. That's biting and devouring one another. And he said, you spend very much time doing that, what's going to happen is you're going to consume one another. You're going to, you're going to eat each other up. So going back to the, the Corinthian letter, but now the second Corinthian letter, chapter 5. Paul says it this way at verse 16. From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. That's a worldly mind. Kelly was talking about the worldly mind a while ago. 
even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, meaning as a human being. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What is he talking about? He is saying that what we need to do in relating, relating to our brothers and sisters is we need to focus on the Christ-like qualities and attributes in that person. We need to focus there rather than on what we might consider to be negative that's about them. Let me, let me try to explain this as best I can. We cannot help but see some of the shortcomings and failings in our brothers and sisters. We will see some of those things. The fact is we're supposed to be loving enough to realize that they're still in the process. But what I need to spend most of my time focusing on, whether it's Kelly or Christy or Sherry or anyone else, is focusing on the Christ that's already in them. And trying to uh, reinforce that possibly. There's a place in the Old Testament that talks about recognizing that that little spark of life in a person is there and we won't suppress that spark to where it goes out. Because with some people that we're around in Christ, it's almost like there's not that much of a spark that you can see there of the life of Christ. But what you want to do is try to find that. Find that spark of Christ in them and, and help to reinforce it. Uh, blow gently on it, you know, with, with the word of faith and, and love and kindness and, and try to reinforce that to where we're bringing out the good that is there. We're not pretending that the bad isn't there. We're not pretending that they still have ways to grow, but we're not focusing on it. I'm not looking at you according to someone in the sinful flesh any longer. Those in Christ, I'm not supposed to see you like that. Though I will see brothers and sisters fail as they can see the same in me, I'm sure. We must look at one another through our Father God's eyes. That's how we guys see people. That's how love works. We must love our neighbor as ourself, is what Paul said. Now let's go back to some of Jesus' words in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 43. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever of you desires to be first shall be the slave of all. Now he's talking about how the kingdom of God works. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The first class I took when I went to Bible college back in 1977, I'd been going to Missouri State for a few years prior to that, go over to uh, Bible College, Central Bible College here in Springfield. The first class I took was called the Gospels, and it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now John is a Gospel as well, but the first three are very similar, the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so what they did in this class is they took us through the Gospel of Mark. And in doing so, he would point to the similarities in Mark that are also in Matthew and in Luke. And the very first verse that my professor took us to was verse 45 of Mark, Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. And he said that's where it all starts. And so that is one of the ways for us to understand how to keep humility really working in our lives, is that if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you're going to be a great servant. You're going to lay your life down for people. John says it this way in his epistle, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 and following. For this we know love, for by this we know love, because Jesus laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. Whoever has this world's good, goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, love, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and truth. 
Now, let me clarify that verse. He's not saying that I can meet every need that's out there in the world because you can't. But you're led by the Spirit and you see times where how your love is going to be expressed is by giving of yourself, of your time, of your love, possibly of your money. This is how love oftentimes work. And he says, because I laid my life down for you, this is what I want you to do for one another. Lay down your lives for one another. Now let me make a statement here that's not exactly quoted there in Scripture, but it's, but it's in the Bible as far as I'm concerned. There's no place in the body of Christ for the spirit of competition. That is actually a demonic perversion of God's intention for His people. Now, in the world we live in, for instance, I mentioned sports earlier. Sports are all about competition. And if properly controlled, brought under the reins of good control and manners, I think it can have a place. I'm not opposed to that. But in the body of Christ, there is no excuse for pastors or leaders or believers in Christ to be getting into competition with one another. That is such a disrespect to God and what He has done and what He is doing. He has made us to be one spirit with Him, therefore one spirit with one another. And as 1 Corinthians 12 speaks, in fact, this whole section of Corinthians that I was in earlier is talking about how the body of Christ is supposed to get along. And they were having problems in Corinth. They were fussing and fighting. And we'll get to that here in just a moment. I'll read some of those verses. But God did something for us through Christ that cannot be understood in anything in this earth apart from God himself and his church. And that is, he has made us one with him and one another. And we all have different function, we have different purpose, we have different calling, but we're all absolutely essential. And what I have noticed in the body of Christ at times is what I would call a very subtle at times and sometimes not so subtle spirit of competition. Uh, one church competing against the next on how many people are coming, how many salvations can even get into a situation that they're, they're competing with one another. Or how much money we give to missions, which by the way is a good thing, but we can get into the spirit, I'm talking about the spirit of competition. Years ago in a church I was involved in, there was a leader in that church, that it was a female leader in this case, that she purposely wanted to pit the various home groups in that church against one another in competition, thinking that will help. We will grow more. Well, you might get more people showing up, but the spirit of it's not of God. Jesus said, whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. That's the flesh. And what's born of the flesh isn't going to accomplish the purposes of God. When I was a kid, uh, one of the churches I went to, very young kid, one of the things they did is they gave out uh, cash, cash offerings for those that brought the most visitors. Now, as a kid, it was like probably a dollar or something like that. When I'm four years old, five, six years old, that's a lot of money to me. But they were doing it ignorantly, I'm sure, and very innocently. But the fact is, that was a competition that if I bring more people to the church, I get that buck or I get that reward. That is the wrong spirit, the wrong motivation. That is certainly not love. Can we do it ignorantly and innocently? Of course we do. A lot of people have done it. But the fact is, we get into competition. I've seen it in the church, people competing in the, in, in the, the, on the worship team, competing with one another. Kelly and Craig and some of you were there at times when we saw some of this stuff. And you thought, this should not be. This should not be. We're not here to compete. We're here to honor God and one another. We're here to recognize that we all have giftings and they're all good. But this spirit of competition, and I want to say to you, is from the devil. When it's found in the church, cut it out and get rid of it as soon as you possibly can. Now going back to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians now, chapter 3, Paul says, I, brethren, 
again he's talking to his brothers and sisters, could not speak to you as spiritual people. Now, you realize he was there for a year and a half, close to two years. He brought them the gospel of Christ, and when he left, they were doing well. They were doing well. Of course, they still needed to grow. People do. But they were doing well, and he left because he had to leave, because God the Father was going to take him to other places to bring the same gospel. When he got away, he heard they're not doing well. He said, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, the word sarkikos, it, sarkikos, it means fleshly, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able. For you are still carnal, sarkikos, you're fleshly. For where there is envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? And it was probably 45 years ago when I first really saw those words for what they mean. Paul is not saying it's a compliment to call them mere men. That is a put down, but it's meant to get their attention. He said, we're not just mere humans any longer. We're those that are energized by the very life of God himself. And he said, but you guys are acting like that's not the case. Because you've got envy, you've got strife, you've got divisions. When I was a kid growing up, what they would call that is they were fussing and fighting. And he said, this ought not to be. Going on in the same letter, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 and following, a rather lengthy section I'm going to read to you. Because he's going to follow up on what he's talking about. They're not getting along right. They're fussing and fighting. They're, they're not taking care of one another right. He said, now in giving these, these instructions, I do not praise you. And as I've said before in the Galatian letter, Paul would rather have not said that. But it is true. Since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. Meaning when you guys are coming together, this isn't working. First of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. For there also must be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Now that's, that language is kind of difficult for me at times to get. He's saying we're not supposed to be dividing off and segmenting one another. But he said the fact is, over time, it's going to happen that in the church you're going to see those that really have given their hearts to the Lord versus the ones that have not. You'll see the difference. But he said these divisions, this is not God's doing. Verse 20, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now what he's saying is you guys aren't doing this right. You're not doing this right. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of the others. See, when they had the Lord's Supper in their day, they actually ate a full meal. And that would not be wrong for us to do these days. We don't typically practice it just like that. But he said, some takes the supper ahead of the others. One is hungry. Another is drunk. What? He says. Do you not have houses to eat in and drink? Or do you despise the church of God? Now, I, those are powerful words. You're despising the church, which is also another way of saying you're despising the sacrifice of Christ. And you shame those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And when he says broken, he knows what that means. He's going to be nearly shattered. I was praying this morning before I came, and this picture came back to my mind again. I don't think of this all the time. But the picture of Jesus, after going through the intensity of his beatings and the crown of thorns on his head, that they literally nailed spikes into his hands, into big old splinter-filled pieces of wood, and nailed spike into his feet to nail him up to that, that cross. My goodness, what a terrible thing. And that's what he's seeing when he said, this is my body broken for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, I want to say before I read on, what most preacher, teacher, leaders were saying when I was a kid growing up that that word means to be doing this in an unworthy manner is that we've got sin in our life that's unconfessed. And that can be true. But that's not what he's talking about. In context, that is not what he's talking about. Is it still true that when I come to take of the Lord's Supper with you together, that if I've got sin going on in my life, I need to deal with that? And the answer is yes, I do. But that is not the context. The context is how we're getting along in the body of Christ. We're fussing and fighting. We're disrespecting one another. We're not caring for one another. We're, he said in his day, some were coming drunk, some were coming hungry, some were rich, some were poor, and they were disrespecting one another. And that is what he's talking about in eating this supper of Christ's sacrifice in an unworthy manner. That's what he means. We're disrespecting Christ because we're disrespecting his children. He said, that is an un unworthy manner and it will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, which we will touch on just in a moment. Let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner. There he said it again. Eats and drinks judgment to himself. And I want you to hear the next phrase. Not discerning the Lord's body. Not getting it. Not getting it. And when he speaks of the body there, he means two things. The literal body of Christ that was sacrificed for us and the body of Christ, which is his church. Because as I will say it again, starting at least chapter 10 in 1 Corinthians, going through chapter 14, all he is talking about is the body of Jesus Christ, which is the church. That's all he's talking about. So we're in that context. He's saying people that are eating this supper to represent blessing Jesus for the sacrifice that are doing it in an unworthy manner are not loving and respecting one another, which is what he's going to talk about in 1 Corinthians 13 about what love really looks like. They're not doing that. He said that's an unworthy manner. Another way to say it, it's, an un, it's a disrespectful manner. I grew up as a kid being told on numerous occasions that I was being disrespectful. And I'm glad that I was told that by parents and people that care because you need to hear that when it's true. We need to learn what real manners are. We need to understand what it is to show respect for another person. That's what love looks like. Even when they've got failures in them, still showing respect. Even our authorities and our government or at the workplace where you work, they're, they're failures in your, your employers. We know that. But we are to show them respect because that's how we're honoring God. But of all things in this life that I am here to show respect toward, it's Jesus Christ, His sacrifice, and His people. That is where it starts. Everything starts there. For me to be disrespectful of Christ's people is to not discern the Lord's body rightly. He said, for this reason, verse 30, many are weak because they don't get it. They don't understand the body of Christ. Many are sick, and among you many sleep, meaning they're dead. For if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. That means He is trying to discipline us to align us to the right way of life. That we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, talking about what we did just a few minutes ago, wait for one another. What does he mean? The same thing I was talking about last week on waiting on the Lord. Serve one another. Wait on one another. It's a verb. It's something we're doing. 
It's trusting. When I'm waiting on you, I'm exercising the faith and the love of God. I'm waiting. I'm not meaning that we're just waiting for someone to show up, although sometimes we do that, but I'm saying we're waiting. It's the word that really means to serve. As we've said in the contemporary world we live in, uh, they used to call the people that serve you at restaurants, they used to call them waiters. They don't really do that as much now, I don't think, but we call them servants, we can call them whatever, but they are waiters, and what are they doing? They're serving you. He said, when you come together, wait on one another. He's saying, lay your life down for that person. Think about them. Think about where they're at. I may not know everything that Lori dealt with this week. I probably don't. Right? Probably don't. We get some information along the way. People walk into a service, and I've been doing this now for 40-some years, and I can't know for sure what they dealt with before they got there that morning. They might have had three children all throw up at once. They might have started out the door and realized they can't find their car keys. They're heading to church and they have a flat tire. Who knows what we've dealt with? Who knows what's going on in our world that we're experiencing? So for me to wait on you is to have some understanding of your life. That doesn't necessarily mean I need to know everything about Liz, although it's, it's always pleasant to hear things about Liz. But I need to have some understanding of you in order to really be a good waiter. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we go to restaurants and some people are just better waiters than others. Have you noticed that? They just seem to care more. And then secondly, they seem to pay more attention. You know, like uh, when your glass has been empty for 15 minutes, that waiter is not doing a very good job of waiting. Correct? One of the things that my dad, I believe, was, was I think, good at teaching his boys, at least he taught me and probably Kelly. I don't know about the young one. I can't say for sure. But, but leaving that one go, he taught us how to be sensitive to the moment as much as possible. How do you wait on people? Well, you learn to be sensitive. Well, if you come in like a bull in the china shop and you do all the talking, you're not really doing a good job of waiting. Not being all that sensitive. And there are times I assure you that I have had experience where I have missed that. Where I have not been sensitive which means I haven't been good at waiting on my brothers and sisters. Because the fact is, one of my greatest assignments in this life is to serve you, the body of Jesus Christ. My first priority is my ministry to God Himself. My second priority, priority in life is to minister to His children. That is scriptural. Third is ministry to all the others as God leads. That's how this works. It's a big deal to God how I treat you. It's a big deal how I love you. It is the biggest of deals. And Paul got away from Corinth and heard what was going on. And he said, what? Now, it wasn't exactly the same thing as in Galatia, the Galatian churches, but it was the similar, what? Don't you understand who we are? Don't you get what Jesus did? This is amazing. He has made us to be one with Jesus Christ. The Father now is our Heavenly Father. We literally are one with the Holy Spirit of God. And then He brought us together to live in a unity that the world could never fully understand. But when they see it, according to John 17, then they'll know Jesus is the real deal. That's how they'll know. So Paul said, we're not doing that. We're not proving to the world that Jesus came from the Father because we're fussing and fighting. And we're being selfish. And we're, we're not caring for one another. We're not literally living to try to find out how to best serve our brothers and sisters. 
The whole chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians are, is about gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us that are always for us to give to someone else in the body of Christ. They're almost never for us individually, though God gives us all kinds of gifts, right? But those gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, are specifically spirit gifts that God gives us to give to our brothers and sisters. So when we come together, one of the most important things that can ever happen is to first realize why we're even doing it, why we're even coming together. We're coming together to honor Jesus and to bless his own, his children. That's why we're coming together. Some would say, well, I go because it blesses me. Well, that's the third on the list. That's the third reason to come. And yes, it should. I'm not sure that we always go away feeling blessed, but the fact is it should happen. But I've marveled through the years since God began to really show me some of this and don't think I have fully arrived because I have not. But I've marveled at how little the people that go to church really understand the body of Christ. I mean, seriously, how little they seem to understand I've heard people say, well, if I don't go, it won't matter. What? What are we talking about here? I'm not going because firstly, it's about me. I'm going because it's about Jesus. I'm going because it's about my brothers and sisters. And the thing is, Paul said, because we don't discern the body rightly, there's some of our brothers and sisters that are weak. Some are sick. Now, he's not saying all oh, sickness is because of that. Some are weak, some are sick. Some have died because they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. I'm not saying they didn't go to heaven. We're saying these are like babes in Christ. Does God love the babes? Well, of course he does. Do I love the babes? You bet I do. But the fact is God intends his children to grow up. And one of the things that Jesus said this on two occasions when he was here. He took a whip, and I'm talking about the real thing, a whip, into the temple, and he starts whipping people and running them out of there and turning over their tables where they're doing business. They're selling goats and, and lambs and doves, and they're exchanging money for people that have come from another location, and they're doing business in the temple. And he can't believe it, that they're disrespecting the Father God to do this. And he runs them out of there. He turns those temp tables over and he comes out of there. And all of his apostles, their disciples that are with him, I'm sure they're wondering what it, what's that all about. And he says on one occasion in, in the Gospel of John, he said, talking to his father, he said, Father, zeal for your house, house has eaten me up. His house... In that day, it was the temple. Today, it's the church. And though I do not want to even come close to putting myself in the same place as Jesus completely where he's at, I am in Christ. I feel that at times. I feel like the zeal for the house of Christ, the house of God, at times almost eats me up. And I don't mean that is negative as much as it sounds. It's that it so drives me. You see, we've got people today that can work in churches and make money. When I was younger, that was not typically the way it worked. You didn't go to school to be a pastor and be a pastor to make money because the fact was you weren't going to. But the fact is today, you can be in some of these churches, not, not all of them, of course, but some, and you can make a lot of money. People that call themselves evangelists can make a lot of money. Not saying they're all wrong, not saying it's all bad, but it can happen. And I have been apprehended by God for something that he has had to develop me over time. But one of the things he's worked in me is such an intensity to respect the body of Christ. That the church be what the church is really supposed to be that at times I feel like it's eating me up. But I thank God for it because that's a good kind of zeal, I believe. Now I need to use it wisely, use it led by the Spirit. We need to learn what the body of Christ really is about. We're waiting on God's children. 
That means to be patient, to be kind, to be humble, to be understanding and forgiving and supportive, that we desire the highest good for that person, that we desire their success in life and for them to be fruitful. You see, one of the most beautiful things that can happen to me is that you prosper in the Lord. How much greater can it be as a parent? I mean, there isn't anything that thrills our hearts more than for our children to prosper in the Lord. And of course, when I say in the Lord, that's what I mean. Now that might mean money, and it can. It might mean houses, it might mean jobs, but I'm talking about prospering in the Lord. That God would show us what he sees when he looks at us. When he looks at Craig, he sees Jesus. Isn't that incredible? And God's not ignorant. He's the wisest of the wise. He knows if Craig's still got some growing to do, might, might have a little bit, right? But he sees Jesus. Craig, you wanna come and help me? I didn't hear it. There is a river. That's fine. That's good. Father, as we have paused again today, as we shared the communion supper earlier, as we have worshipped and as we've prayed and we have spoken the word of God, we recognize that in one sense we are all standing on holy ground. Because here we are, Lord, in your presence. Here we are, partakers of the divine nature of God. And Lord, every day we're learning the magnitude of what that even means, of what it means that we are children of God. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And so Father, today as we have given all that we have to give. Let these words, by your Spirit, bless into the hearts of your people. Because your word is alive and it's powerful and it's, just, it's sharp. It's like a, a two-edged sword and it can divide the soul and spirit. And Lord, that's what we need for your word to do, is to break down into our hearts because when we come to you with your people, we want to always come with full honor in heart toward you. All glory, all majesty, all praise. And Lord, we want to leave this place knowing that we have blessed you. And one of those areas of life where we're learning how to bless you is how to bless your children because you love it so much. When we love, love your children. You love it when we love, because Lord, we've come to understand that this faith that you gave us has to be energized by love. For there is a river that flows from deep from deep within there is a fountain that frees our soul from sin so come to this water there is a vast supply and there is a river that never shall run Grayson.